There seems to be a mitzvah that when you say words of Torah or words of prayer, you have to have some separation between your lower parts, private parts, sexual organs, and your upper body. This, way, this is why we have the kettle. That's right. So that's why that for praying, you had to put on a belt. But was that because people didn't have underpants? That's right. That's all they wore, a robe. To make a difference between the lower part. To make a separation between the lower part and the upper part. Exactly. So nowadays, of course, we dress a little bit differently. <laughs> like you said, we have underpants. Underpants have already elastic bands, usually. If not, a string. And then we have pants, usually, in the Western world, which have a button or a zipper or some clasp. And then we have a belt that has some kind of a, um, a clasp as well. And then we have a shirt, which is a separate piece. So already, naturally, our bar, bar lower parts are separated between the, uh, are separating between, from, from the upper parts. So the question is, do we still have to wear this garta? So the answer is, the strict halacha is no. As long as you have a separation between your upper part and lower part. It doesn't have to be particularly black, the kind that you wrap around three times and you tuck in in a special way. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it's, it's okay if it's elastic. Um, but what you do, if you just rely on that, you miss out on something else. Because part of the process of getting ready for prayer was to put on your belt. It's called Hikon Likrat Elokech Yisrael. Prepare yourself in honor of greeting your God. If you just go from the boardroom to the synagogue, dressed as you are, you're not really preparing to meet the Hashem. And so that's why until today many people say, even though you have underwear, and you have a belt, and you have pants, and you have a separation, still you should do something, an act, which signifies I'm getting ready for prayer. So of course, yesterday we mentioned you have to wash your hands. But beyond that, to wear something different, this is the custom of the Hasidim until today. The Hasidim, they say you must wear a garto, a special extra belt, that you, and it's the traditional belt. Is there any way how to wear it? So there is tradition. There's tradition. It's not law. None of Before this is we law. Go there, can I ask sure, you? sure. About the dressing. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know, um, just imagine I'm coming from the bathroom. May, may yeah. I need to go to the shower team. May I, maybe I take a shower. So when I'm coming from my bathroom, mm -hmm. in the bathroom, I could be naked. Okay. And I want to say a palacha, because I will also go to the toilet and something like that. Or maybe I'm right. very thirsty, I want to bring something. Not allowed. How much clothes I need to have on my body? So what we just learned is that you have to have a separation between your upper parts and your lower parts. So that means it's... Uh, and if you're wearing cover uh, your underwear, that's fine. Yeah. I don't need to have a t-shirt. No. So just my underwear. It's, uh... That's right. Okay. okay. Your underwear. We're assuming that that has an elastic band that separates between the upper parts and lower parts. That's all you need. Yeah. Take a look on page sixty-four. We'll see it inside. One should wear a belt while praying, for the belt creates a division between one's upper body, including the head and the heart, and one's erva, nakedness. In that regard, prayer is superior to other mere matters of sanctity. For concerning other matters of sanctity, it is unnecessary to wear a belt specifically. In other words, a bracha, for example, or learning Torah. You don't wear that special belt all day long if you're learning Torah. Some people do. <laughs> Some people are very careful, but really, it's specifically for prayer. Are there any separation between one heart and one's nakedness is acceptable? Therefore, anyone wearing underwear, you ask the question, 
has a divider between his heart and his herva. However, out of respect for the prayer service, it is a mitzvah to wear a belt. So that is a respectful way to pray. As it is written, Israel, prepare. That's what I was telling you before. Hikon likrat elohecha. Prepare to meet your God, Israel. Nevertheless, someone who normally walks around the whole day without a belt need not put one on before praying. As I said, the idea of putting on a belt, part of it was to get yourself more dignified, more, more uh, respectable when you're going to come in front of the king. But if you all dressed up in your suit and pants, and underpants, and belt, in your finest Armani suit, right? I see you're wearing Armani. Yeah, you're very, very nice. So then, simple halacha is you don't have to put on an additional belt. But the Hasidim, as I said, Hasidim have this custom that uh, they stick with their traditions. And on top of the suit, they put this, yeah. this black uh, garter. Some people have a... It was funny. Yeah. It's funny. I remember uh, I had to put, you know, with Shaul, right? Uh, about the shoes. Sure, now. I know Shaul, yeah. And we added about this, about uh, about the belt. So I asked him, why is the belt? Then he told me that, yeah, because before people didn't have underpants. That's true. So yeah. when I came to this time, I saw people with the belt, I was thinking, like, hey, what? Maybe they're, belt they're belt? Not <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they're not wearing underpants. No, no, no. We have one more paragraph, and then it will finish about this. Page 64. It is an extra pious act to always put on a belt for prayer because a belt signifies the separation between the lofty side of a person, comprised of the brain and the heart, and the lowly part of a person containing his air and legs. Most people are deeply involved in their bodily desires. Their brains and hearts are occupied solely with matters of the moment and materialism. However, the Jewish people who receive Torah from heaven are capable of overcoming their basic, baser inclinations. They can direct their minds and hearts to superior matters subsequently returning to the world of materialism and action in order to repair it. That is what the belt worn during prayer represents. Chachamim even instituted a special bracha concerning this in the morning blessings. Ozer Israel Bikvura, who girds Israel with strength. And Azor is a belt. This explains why Hasidim enhanced the mitzvah by wearing a special prayer. A belt for prayer, a gartel is the way it's pronounced in most places. They say that the, the joke is, you know, the Hasidim, they, they put an emphasis on emotion in prayer, as opposed to the, uh, the opposers, they're called the Mitznagdim, you might have heard that, that term, Mitznagdim, the people who were against the Hasidic movement. It was a new movement. And the, uh, so in Lithuania in particular, the Misnagdim were very strong, and they were against the, uh, these customs, which were sort of essentially new. Hasidim were very much put an emphasis, because the heart, the heart has to, has to be used in your prayers. And they say, so that's why the Hasidim, they put, their, they put the, the gartel here, and then the Hasidim would laugh, at the, at the uh, Misnagdim and say, Misnagdim, they don't put their heart into anything. They have a gartel over here <laughs> between their head and their heart. <laughs> misnagdim is again the opposers, the people who meet Nagdim, meet Nagdim, Misnagdim, the people who oppose the Hasidic movement. The more rationalistic um, uh, sort of, the elite of, of the, of the uh, Torah world was more involved in Torah study, intellectual Torah study, didn't put as much an emphasis on the, the, the emotional side of Judaism. This was the, the big claim to fame of the Hasidic movement. And so the joke is, you know, the Gartel uh, is below the heart, where in the, Has the Misnagdim, the, the, the opposers, they have the Gartel <laughs> separating their heart from their brains. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, is not what you want to do. You want to have the heart and your mind. Um, it's symbolic, of course. It's symbolic uh, that the heart and the mind should be dedicated to higher things in life, not just the lower, more materialistic parts of life. But um, it is a mitzvah, as it says in Amos, to prepare for prayer. So to straighten up your clothing a little bit, 
you know, fix, uh, maybe tuck your shirt in or uh, whatever it is uh, that you do. If you don't have a gartel, if you have a gartel, well, that's what you do to signify that you're getting ready for prayer. You have that special belt. Okay. So it's the same like uh, when we dress up on uh, Shabbat, we take our special clothes, maybe a tie, maybe uh, other sure. things. Sure, sure. So it's to, to get uh, ready to prepare yourself for coming to Hashem. Correct, correct. There's a similarity in that we should have special clothing for Shabbat, and you have to dress appropriately for prayer as well. We're studying here Torah. If somebody would come up here in a bathing suit, inappropriate. You're not going to the beach. You're coming to, to study Torah. So you have to dress appropriately, and so much more so when you come to pray in front of Hashem. Leads us to page 65. The next paragraph speaks about the appropriate dress, the laws of the appropriate dress for prayer. Are you ready? I want to ask, how tight is the tie? So, so the, the Hasidim have the traditional way that they sort of wrap it around a few times and then they sort of create a little loop mm-hmm. and stick the end of the, of the belt into the loop and that sort of hooks it on. It creates a little bit of a, a latch. But um, you don't have to do it that way. No. You don't have to do it that way. It's a custom. It's a custom, sure, yeah. But if you do it in another way, it's also okay. Absolutely. They, there is a, I was at a wedding last week of a former student of ours, and the rabbi who was uh, officiating was a student of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Hasid Chabad. And uh, it was really funny because they're very careful. It's a, it's a well-known custom that, that uh, when you get married, your dress should, um, based on the Kabbalah, the, your dress should not have any, any knots in it because you're supposed to be open to the new relationship. You're supposed to be some a special moment when you do the spiritual act of getting married. So, for example... If you're wearing shoes with shoelaces, you untie the shoelaces. You shouldn't have any, any ties in your, in your clothing. And so the, the fellow instructed the chatan that his necktie should be open, should be loose. And so everybody that came was guests, said, it was so nice to see you, and hey, let me just straighten your necktie. Let me tighten it for you. <laughs> and the rabbi would say, no, 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 loose, loose. It should be looser. And I explained them that, you know, I don't think that's considered to be a tie. It's not mm-hmm. like you tie your shoes with a knot mm-hmm. or, or, you know, the way you tie a necktie. Halakhically also by the laws of Shabbat, it's not considered to be a, 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 a prohibited way of tying. Uh, there's a machloket, but most poskim say that you're allowed to tie a tie on Shabbat because it's not a knot. It's not a double knot for sure. And so it's not considered to be a tie. So, but... He's in charge. I didn't fight. I'm not gonna. But it was, because I didn't, you know, fight with him about it, it kept on happening. People would come up to him and straighten up, pull up his tie because it doesn't look nice for the pictures. But anyways, he got married. That's the main thing. And uh, so it's okay to have knots. So when you get married, there is this kabbalistic custom not to have any knots in in your dress, but. For, for the daily prayers, there's no problem with that. There's no prohibition of that. You know. But maybe that's why they have this special way of looping it in and, and sort of attaching it without actually creating a, a, what we call today a knot or a double knot. Right? And what's about the Dalit? We the, have no Dalit. That's right. That's right. It's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to, to tie the tzitzit onto the Dalit. Exactly. So uh, it's not everywhere. Absolutely. As I was saying, this is a specific... Unique custom of some groups when you get married. I mean, all day long, where do you have, we have a, a war against knots. Mm. <laughs> we always have knots. It's part of our life, right? It's yeah. uh, nothing wrong with knots. The chupa is, is not the chupa too. Right? The chupa is uh, yeah, the, but okay. Every, everybody has their customs. It's fine. They're, they're, they're you know deep meanings they're trying to express in the world. And it's fine, but don't yeah. confuse that and say it's halakha, or you can't mm-hmm. put on a belt unless you tie it in this specific way. You know, each each uh, the, the belt has, a, has, as I said, it has a much a more, a more ancient custom. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to start on page sixty-five now.
The appropriate dress for prayer. How did you say 65? Leu. 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 It's like 6, 10, 5. Yeah. Leu. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The appropriate dress for prayer. Stephen wanted to read for us. The appropriate dress for prayer. A person who finds himself in a situation in which he has no clothes is obligated to wear at least shorts and an undershirt for prayer. Brakos 25a, Shukan Arus 9.91 verse 1. Although while reciting Shima and Brakos it is sufficient, Bedivet to only cover only one Eva. Shukan Arus 74.6. While praying the Amida before the king, one must at least cover his eva and his heart, meaning his front and back. Do you understand the Ravid? So I was correct. I gave you the right answer before. You want to say a bracha? You only need underpants. That's the main thing. But for tefillah, you should put on a shirt. Okay. Keep going. All this is bedieva. That's that's the bare minimum. Literally, <laughs> the bare minimum. <laughs> However, go ahead. All this is a very bad, but lehakila one should enhance the mitzvah by wearing respect, respectable clothing for prayer, so that one show at least as much honor to God as he does to human beings. Just as a person is careful to wear dignified clothing when meeting important people, so too he must dress at least as respectable before praying. Indeed, a person who goes out once in his life to greet a king makes sure to wear his nicest clothes. However, a person who sees the king every day does not wear his fanciest garment, but he does make sure to wear clothes that suit his profession and status. Similarly, we come before the king three times a day and we therefore dress nicely for prayer, but we save our finest apparel for Shabbat. Festivals and joyous celebration, everything depends on the custom of the place and the person. There are communities where everyone is accustomed to wearing a suit and hat to significance even. Thus, they are required to dress that way for prayers as well. Likewise, in a, prayer, in a place, where it is not acceptable as it is not accepted to appear before important people in sandals without socks. Certainly one must wear socks with his sandals while praying as well. Yet in place where people usually walk around in sandals without socks, do not wear ties and hat even when approaching important people, they need not adopt different garb for prayers. Based on okay, Shukata. so this is uh, you know about fifty years ago in Europe, in America, in the Western society, maybe a little more, it was considered inappropriate to walk outside without looking like Ravid. The hat, the fedora, the suit, this is what respectable people wore. And, uh, but then, what happened was, society changed. The Western world changed. People stopped wearing hats. People don't wear fedoras so often. It's not common. And uh, even suits. You don't know, maybe for a business meeting, maybe, you know. But in, uh, walk, people walk around the streets all the time without any, without any jacket. They just wear a shirt. And so the style of dress has changed. And so the halacha is based on what's common. So, the style has changed? The style has changed, yes, of course. Styles of, I think of, the behavior has changed, not the style. Okay. Well, the, the, the behavior we're talking about is the style of dress. So the style of dress, the way people, the fashion, the way mm. people dress in, 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 uh, well, in public. No, there are no any more boundaries about that. <laughs> well, there's some. There's some. There's some places where they say, you're not allowed entry into the restaurant without sleeves, wearing a tank top, right? In some places, they have that, you know, it's got to be some level of minimal dress, right? Dress code. But in other places, it's even, even that is, is considered to be normal. So, 
When it comes to prayer, you follow what the custom is. So if people, uh, you know, uh, walk around publicly, it's considered to be respectful to wear a shirt, to wear a t-shirt. People wear t-shirt and jeans to, to work nowadays. People wear t-shirt and jeans to all, all day long. So there's nothing wrong with praying that way. Now, there's a group of religious Jews who uh, have taken upon themselves a very particular dress code. The fedora and the jacket. And this is part of, I believe, it's part of the uh, historical movement to, to keep our values in a changing world. The world is changing so much. It's changing so, you know, with so many uh, different, uh, not only external things, but also what the morals are of society in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, modesty, in terms of uh, what's considered to be uh, appropriate action as well. There's just so much change, so this community took upon themselves, we are going to have a uniform, which is going to be just like our forefathers. <laughs> our forefathers would be wearing a robe. <laughs> so not really our forefathers from a thousand years ago, but from a hundred years ago. The way it was respectable to dress, because we see that's our teachers, our rabbis, who lived a hundred years ago. They wore a hat and a jacket. So we'll continue to wear a hat and jacket, even though outside of the Orthodox uh, Haredi world, nobody wears a hat anymore. You only wear a hat if you are in a yeshiva. So, uh, so it's really uh, unique that they, they sort of took a picture, a snapshot in time, and froze it. So this is called respectable dress, even though what they're wearing, of course, is, was not worn 100 years before that, or 200 years before that, or 300 years before that. The dress always changes on the culture, the, the country, the styles of dress, whatever, every, every uh, country, what is considered respectable. And so um, I, in particular, I don't necessarily identify with that specific group. And so I don't put on a hat and jacket for prayer. I wear what I consider, what uh, in my circles is considered to be respectful dress. It's a nice shirt, a nice pair of pants. You know, I don't come in my short and t-shirt, right? Uh, but uh, the, there are two votes written. Rabbis speak about what happens on the kibbutzim. Kibbutz. Very famous that, uh, you know, 50 years ago when they were, or 70 years ago when they were um, trying to create a new type of society, right? You know, the socialist experiment mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, common living and everybody together. They also changed their style of dress. Most of them were farmers in, in hot areas. And so they would wear shorts mm -hmm. at all times. Famously, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel. He was a kibbutznik. And this, like many of the leaders of the Israeli uh, society, and so he felt very comfortable, and he would, he would receive his guests, heads of state, coming to visit him in his home. He'd receive them wearing shorts. This is the way he dresses. This is what's considered normal. And if you look on the kibbutz, even on Shabbat, even the religious kibbutzim, they keep Shabbat and they come to pray, they all wear shorts. On sandals. And sandals without socks, of course. That is what they decided as a society. This is our standard of respectable clothing. And the halakha says they're right. They're 100% right. What you have to wear is respectable, distinguished clothing according to the norms of that society. I'm not going to judge you based on you know, what the norms are in, in uh, India or in Africa or in Europe. If you've created a society where everybody thinks that there's nothing wrong with wearing shorts, even to the most dignified dinner, then that's what you can wear. There's no rules about, you know, it has to be specifically a hat or specifically a jacket of this cut or that cut or this style, that style. But, of course, it depends on the society that you live in. So I think the Haredi world has created a little bit of a society where they've, they've as I said, took a snapshot in time and this is our... Uh, it's a little bit of an identity marker, right? It's, it's, it's a uniform. We belong. Everybody who belongs to this group has to wear the hat and jacket. And so for davening, they put on the hat and jacket. Although uh, right here, we see rarely in Machon Meir, or the religious Zionist world, we have a different standard. Uh, more connect, more, you know, 
majority of Western society where you go visit the, uh, even the President of the United States, he doesn't wear a hat anymore, right? Maybe Roosevelt wore a hat, Truman maybe. But this is, uh, you know, a long time ago. Now, for many, many maybe years now. Problems. Maybe, maybe. But no, not any longer, right? There's no, you, you see all the meetings of the heads of states, they wear suits, yes, but no, no hats. Nobody wears a hat anymore. The fedora somehow got chosen as the marker, identity marker of a specific group of Haredi, uh, you know, world, the yeshiva world, which is fine. That's their choice to make a, you know, an identity. Some people about what type of kippah? Uh, it becomes a real the identity marker. Is what type of kippah do you wear? Do you wear a knitted kippah or a velvet kippah? Is that people are a little independent. <laughs> I like the people that they wear a kippah sruga underneath a hat. <laughs> so they have a little bit of both worlds. I am who I am. I'm part of this group. I'm not part of the group. Everybody says, it's good to choose a group that you belong to. In any case... Uh, this is not halakha. The halakha is the dress has to be appropriate, respectable. Not your finest, because we talk to the king three times a day, as he says, not only once a year. But uh, it should be appropriate and respectable dress for if you were to greet uh, dignitaries. And uh, so sandals without socks also is quite common in our parts, that people wear sandals in the summertime, obviously, um, without socks. And um, So it's acceptable sandals without socks? In in the yeah in the community where that's normal, then but you don't have to change that. That's what's considered to be normal. But yeah. you, can, you can assume that the Chazal only was wearing sandals, right? Probably right, and they wore a robe also. So, but we don't dress like Chazal, so it doesn't really help us one way or the other. But no, what it does show us is that it's not considered to be private parts, right? It's not considered to be disgusting, mm-hmm. something like that, right? All society cover their private parts, right? Um, and like we said, you must wear a shirt at least to cover your front and back. Um, it doesn't say anything about sleeves, but uh, there are there are some it's a, it's details. A, it's a cultural aspect, right? Because this yeah. is, in the Western, they consider it not modest. Not modest. It's a standard yeah, to wear right. sandals. In the, yeah. in the Middle Eastern way, that's just than I am. But yeah, yeah. This may, but it's like if you have a. In every country you go when they have a work, work event and the director comes with the sandals, people are going to be like... Yeah. We are living in a free world, everyone can do what they want to do, but most things what we are going to do is coming from our, from our home. We learn this from our parents. Right, because what we get I used to. When right. I was a kid and it was time to come to the table to eat, before you come to the table, you need to wash your hands. If you don't do it, my mother didn't give me anything to eat. <laughs> right. And also my clothes. So I remember the time, like you say, when, uh, look how you are looking. You're not going to the beach. You're coming to eat. You need to be dressful, respectful. Right. And it's right. also when you go to your, your work. And uh, when I'm working in the office, I use, I cannot go with my shorts to my uh, office. Right, right. Right. Of course, it's you cannot so it's forbidden, but it's something uh, it's an unofficial dress yes. code. Also, the world has become less and less and less and less and less formal and more and more casual. Mm-hmm. It used to be you to go to work. Of course, you dressed informal. Mm-hmm. You wore a suit. You wore a tie. But then nowadays, I think it's been the last uh, 30, 40 years. Um, a lot of the, the workforce has, uh, has been getting younger also, and um, we have young people in charge of companies that are worth more than uh, the heads of state <laughs> of an entire state, right? We have these young uh, startup companies, and they wear shorts and t-shirts. And so uh, when I was working in the bank, there was casual Fridays. Mm. On Fridays, you're allowed to come in casual clothes. Yeah. It still has to be respectful, but it doesn't have to be formal. It could be casual, right? So you could wear sneakers right, instead of, of the dress shoes, right? Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't have to wear your suit. You wear just a shirt, right? So that's, that's casual. And then there are nowadays, the, 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 the casual is the norm. Casual is everywhere. Everybody is in the high-tech companies. For sure, no formality whatsoever. Everybody but wears the question is, is it good or is it not good? 
Because what I'm looking, uh, I have this picture, uh, a police officer, he has a uniform, I can recognize him, and then when I see him, he's coming to me, there is a respect because I see he is a policeman, mm. but when he would be dressed like a uh, casual, how can I have respect to, to, uh, for him? Right. So yeah. I think... Um, uh, it's a good question. It's a good question. How how important is formality in life and uniforms? And some people say a Torah Jew, Torah observant Jew, should be dressed differently. And we should have a uniform. So <laughs> I think we mentioned the rabbis coming to the bima and have shorts. <laughs> you don't have to imagine it. You can see it. There's some really? community. Yes. Absolutely. A rabbi in the kibbutz you? on the kibbutz, yeah. You yeah. Sure. Yeah, maybe uh, less and less, uh, but. Uh, yeah, anything happens nowadays. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's important to have an identity markers, like we mentioned. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you have to dress like, you know, uh, a fedora like a hundred years ago. But, uh, you know, nowadays identity markers are very clear. Right? The kippah, tzitzit, right? Peot, some people have, right? Yeah, special, special kinds of peot. We'll talk about that another time. And let's skip to the bottom of page 65. If one is wearing disgraceful clothes... If, if one is wearing disgraceful clothes, nobody, not one on the street, such as dirty work clothes or short, which he put on to work in his yard, it's better that he change his clothes, even if he will miss praying with a minyan. If he wears such clothing to pray, he will offend the respect of heaven. Additionally, there is concern that he will not be able to concentrate on his prayer, since he will be thinking that everyone is staring at his disgraceful dress. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, then the, the details, he says, is, uh, let's just keep going a, one, a little bit. Uh, those whose profession require them. Those whose profession require them to wear work clothes and it is difficult for them to change before praying, are permitted to pray in their work clothes because for them, this article of clothing are not considered disgraceful. Nevertheless, in situations in which they have time to change their clothes, they should try to come to prayer in more respectable attire. One should not pray in pajamas. Mishnah Burua 91 verse 11. However, a person who is ill is permitted to pray in pajamas. Because it is acceptable, it is accepted that one who is not feeling well wear pajamas, even when important people come to visit him. This was a big question when uh, in Corona times. Many uh, everybody was stuck at home. Mm. At some period, there were lockdowns, and there's no you weren't allowed to go to Minyan. Mm. Mm. Pajamas is uh, what you wear to go to sleep, sleeping clothes. Mm. Oh. Pajamas. Yeah. Pajamas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that in Chinese? Is there a word for pa pajamas? Sui. 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 Sleeping clothes. Sui. 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 Okay. Sleeping clothes. Yeah, exactly. So many people, they were, didn't go to work. They were, they were no going to school. You were home all day. Everybody wore the pajamas all day long. <laughs> this was for, it was a plague, an international plague, um, you know, uh, these this, this shirim, you know, hopefully in a few years people won't believe that there was such a crazy thing in our lifetime, that everybody was stuck at home, and they didn't get dressed, and didn't go to work, and they didn't go to shul, nothing, everybody prayed by themselves, no minyan. So the question was, can you play, pray, can you pray at home, you pray your shacharit min charit, can you pray in your pajamas? Or do you have to, well, I'm going to pray. I have to put on my clothes. So the answer is right here. You saw it. If it's considered to be normal, even if important people come to you when you're at home, you don't, you, you're at home. You dress like you're, you dress at home. Um, many postkim said that you can pray in your pajamas as well. As long as you're not wearing something disgusting or something inappropriate. Also, uh, it happens many times when you're on a tiyul, Soon we're going to have a tiyul to uh, on Hanukkah. Every Hanukkah, the Mechon Meir goes on a tiyul to the Negev, and we hike. 
and maybe um, we'll have to dive in Mincha before you get back to where you you're, can change your clothes. Can you pray? Wearing your shorts and your t-shirt, your hiking clothes, maybe you're, you're wearing your sneakers, you're wearing, you know, it's not what you normally would you wear to pray. So I think they try, they try, they usually come back and uh, give you a chance to shower and change and, and to your more respectable clothing. But if you're not, if you're playing sports all day and you have to daven mincha, as long as it's normal for what you're doing, like he said, people who, who uh, are painters, mm. And they wear their paint, paint clothes full of paint all day long. That's normal. Or their work clothes. There's a fellow here who's a, a, a you know, utility man who fixes things. He has like this special bra blue uniform. You know what I'm talking about? People know him. Yeah. His name is Nisim. He comes to Mincha wearing his blue uniform. He doesn't go like that to, on Shabbat. He doesn't go like that if he's going to go out to visit the king or to, to meet. But... This is what he wears all day long. This is considered to be his normal attire. And you're allowed to pray in your work clothes. Those articles of clothing, they're not considered disgraceful if that's what you wear because of your, because of your activity, what you're used to doing. So people that are you know, runners, athletes, right in the Olympic Village, everybody's wearing uh, jogging suits and sneakers. Oh, that's what they do. This is what they, so they can pray in their... Sneakers and in their jogging suits. Uh, it's ideal. It's best if you have, you know, you wear your more, you know, uh, what's regular, co regularly considered to be by the greater society, what's considered to be distinguished clothing, respectable clothing. But if you are involved your whole day in that type of activity, you can wear those clothing. It's not considered to be any disrespect. You're not like, you know, uh, dressing down <laughs> because of prayer. It's just, this is the, the activities that you're doing this day. And so if you're at home and you're wearing pajamas all day because your job is to rest, get my son now, unfortunately, he got sick. He was throwing up, diarrhea. Yeah. Saturday night, all day, he slept uh, Sunday, all day. He can wear his pajamas to, to pray. Because uh, even if, his, uh, if he had a visitor who would come into him, maybe he put on a... A bathrobe, you know, maybe something, but he wouldn't get dressed because he's being sick. He's mm -hmm. he's resting. He's getting better, and that's what he's involved in. And so you're allowed to pray in that those uh, in those clothing as well, as long as you have a separation between your upper and lower parts. As long as your 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 chest is covered, um, you can pray. Okay, so I hope that's clear. It was beautiful in the beginning of the Corona time. Yeah. I saw people coming outside, standing on their balcony, and before they coming outside, they change the clothes. Ah, ah, still have the sensitivity of respectable uh, dress when you go out. Right, right. Take a look at the last paragraph here. He sort of says what uh, what I've been saying. Sometimes a person is in a spot. Page sixty-six, the last paragraph. A person is in a place where people normally dress less formally, such as a vacation spot. There, even those who always wear suits, may wear just shirts without a jacket. In such a situation, however, whoever is not embarrassed to walk around without a suit, even before distinguished people, may also pray that way, right? If everybody's uh, at a uh, vacation resort, Everybody's going to be wearing maybe, you know, a polo shirt or something like that. Even the president, the prime minister, the mayor, whoever it is, the heads of the companies, these big companies, right now we're on vacation. We're all dressing casually. There's nothing forbidden about casual dress. Um, if, and I think more and more, the entire world <laughs> is taking on those customs of a vacation spot. It's, uh, people walk around town like they're on vacation. People walk around town uh, without formal dress. Uh, and so it's become more and more accepted that you can pray that way. And um, uh, it's good to have, you know, to wear respectable clothing. But what, uh, it depends on society. So if in society it's accepted to be less formal, you can pray with less formal clothing as well. And that's, uh, I think, a common custom in our in our in our uh, culture here, in our, uh, our group, 
a cultural group here, little groupings. Good. You don't like it. You're you're more of a formal know. attire man. Yeah, uh, not in every way, but when I remember when I was a kid, I'm coming to school, a teacher. At that time, I'm talking about a uh, <laughs> very long time ago. He has a suit, a tie, and he was a teacher. Mm -hmm. I called him with a name. Miss Sir, Mr. Or teacher, yes, yes. But now the teacher's coming with shorts, and when you call the. By you know, their name, you, their name, the yeah. First name? First name, right, right. It's like when uh, I'm talking to a rabbi, I don't say, Chaim. I have a question. No, I need to give my respect to the right, rabbi. Right, right. I think this is very important. I hear, I hear you. I think that we, we're losing something in society when we yes. get rid of formality. Formality uh, helps, helps you show respect. But um, on the other hand, why, why do people run away from formality? Because they feel not connected. Disconnected, they feel that it's sort of um, distant and not true. Maybe it's like an act. Maybe people don't want it. They want to be very authentic. And so uh, yeah, I think we have to find the right balance. I think if we lose all formality, it would not be good. Mazal tov. Mazal tov. Sandak. Ma Hashem shel hanarach hanolad. Eh? Shachar. What do we pray every morning? What do we pray every morning? What do we pray? Shacharit. Morning. It means the morning prayer. Shachar. Should have mazal tov, mazal tov. Okay, he's sharing with us the, the spoils from the from the uh, celebration they had yesterday. The vakasha. Okay, so we'll, we'll all share in a bracha. Everybody, let's make it. This looks like a mazonot. It's a cake. Amen. 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 What just happened here? Totally fine, totally normal. Because we're in a casual society. In another place, the rabbi has to make the bracha first. You wait. And the most important person, not that I'm so important, but in this context, right? He makes the first the bracha first. You don't start eating before the, the, the head of the table. Right? So this has changed. Society is different. Yeah, this is you mentioned this. You yeah, got things to learn that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm. So I we are. No, don't. I, mean, I, I didn't mean to to no, it's, to it's say important. it as a criticism, but it's, it's we've been talking about formality, and it's a sensitivity that you should have. The <laughs> the um. That uh, of course we have to show respect to our rabbis and our teachers and our parents, and uh, you know important people. But uh, society is very much uh, less and less and less formal. And uh, most rabbis would not even think of it. But I we were just talking about it, mm -hmm. so it, uh, I figured I'd use it to teach. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying that you did anything wrong. <laughs> But there could be down the street or in another institution or, or you know, in another society where they are a little more formal. Yeah. They would expect you to say, Rabbi, you make the bracha first, right? And some places they still do that today. That's good. Mm -hmm. And you like formality, you just said. <laughs> because I, I remember when we get to, to the table to eating, my father always said, don't go to eat before your mother is sitting down. Beautiful, nice to reason. wait. That's a sign of She's respect. Respectful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's working for so many times to prepare the dinner right. or something to eat. You need to wait until you start eating. Okay, sounds like you got some good uh, messages from your parents. It's very good. We know 
what is the the, the basic maintenance? Uh, because uh, we go to the different different uh, house or different different place. Sometimes we don't know what is what is the basic. As as long as we we learn here, we know what is the basic. Then we have uh, the basic. Uh, we, what we expect, we go to a house. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, it's it's so difficult, mm. especially uh, here now in Israel. We have from people from different continents, mm. <laughs> five different continents, with different standards and different customs, different culture and expectations. Mm. And it's very hard to figure out what uh, some people is obvious, other people that's surprising. I've never seen that before in my yes, life. Yes. Right? Yes. And so there's a mix and there's, there's a, a cultural differences mm. but respect that we have is to... So it's so important. You can show respect in many ways. It doesn't have to be only formality. You can show respect in... Uh, I, I'm living here at the corner. Yeah. We have a Malit and an elevator. Mm. And one day I stay there downstairs and the woman also come. She also like to go up. It's a suit to go together in the elevator. Mm. So yeah. I give her the elevator I take to the stairs. It's a kind of respect. Sure. And I saw that before. Other people, they don't do it. I'm the first, so I'm going first. No! <laughs> okay. Right, right, right. Those different cultures. In, in the, I think, uh, 50 years ago, and it's still in some places, but only in really, really formal circumstances, you would have to open the door for to let the lady into the car, right? You have to open the door for her. She wouldn't do it herself. Yes. Nowadays, women are driving. <laughs> the men is... <laughs> but look at the bath. Young people sitting down. There's no place anymore. And the elderly is coming inside. They don't stand up. That still applies. Because that, they don't learn so, yeah. how to give respect. Right, right, right. No. We, have to, we have to teach, to teach uh, how to have respect, even though we're living in a less formal society. This, you know, I, don't, I don't equate formality with respect. You can give respect even in an informal society. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. we, have to, we, we, we lose something if, we, if we're not uh, careful. Okay, we move ahead. We're gonna, we, we talked about uh, dress right, for prayer. Yes? yes. Is this the uh, same as the uh, expectation for a woman as well? That's right. Similar, similar idea. Also, respectable, whatever is considered to be normal in society. Um, and uh, a woman has to cover her private parts, just like we said, have a separation between upper and lower as well. Most women also have some kind of a band on their underwear or some kind of a you know, skirt or whatever it is. And um, that's enough. I've never seen women put on a girdle. <laughs> a girdle, yes. A girdle is something else that's part of women's underwear, but uh, uh, it's not an obligation to, uh, if it's not the custom, like I said, that was the custom of, of, of men, to put on a, a belt. Actually, putting on a belt has a little bit of a connotation of, of a, like a warrior would put on his uh, belt that had his weapons in it, right? Like, Chagor Har Bechal Yarech Gibor Hod Chava Adarech, that's a pasuk that says the mighty soldier puts on his belt. Mm -hmm. and we say, but women make the bracha Ozeri Yisrael Bigvarua in the morning as well. Women say the bracha about putting on a belt. So it's a, it's a standard part of uh, uh, clothing. Um, those, okay, yeah. The very language of war, right, in, in, in the Bible, like, Great, great, great gird yourself. Your That's right. Gird your loins. Gird your loins, right? It's like we're ready to... Get ready to move, right? You get, if you have a long robe, you can't really run so well. So you so you would hit... Things. Yeah, take them up, hitch, hitch them around your waist, and then that's, you know, girding your loins. Yeah. yeah. Usually a belt is the best. Okay, so there's other laws about preparing for prayer, but uh, we, we, I want to move on. Uh, one important one is little... Uh, again, more details, but... Page 69, section 8. One who must relieve himself while praying. The Chachamim teach that one who needs to relieve himself, be it to urinate or to defecate, is prohibited from praying, since the need to relieve himself is likely to disrupt his kavana. In addition, it is not proper to come to pray before HaKadosh Baruch Hu when one's body is made repulsive by the excrement inside him, even if he is uncertain as to whether he needs to relieve himself, it is proper that he try 
before beginning to pray. Chachamim, support your statement with the verse, Israel, prepare to meet your God. It's that same verse that we said about the belt. He and prepare. So one of the elements of preparing for prayer is going to the bathroom to relieve yourself, to empty your bladder, or to check to see if you need to. It is also written, guard your foot when you go into the house. Guard your foot. Okay, foot is a... Is a used as a euphemism here, meaning make sure you do not need to relieve yourself at the time that you are standing to pray. Okay, so the halakha, like always, the halakha has to try to define how empty do you have to be. What if you need to go, but you could wait an hour, you could wait two hours. You know that you have a little urine that you have to pass. You're not allowed to pray. You're going to miss the minyan if you go now to the bathroom. Because, you know, it's a matter of minutes. You either catch it or you don't. You want to start together with everybody. But you'll miss the, the minyan. Mm. So uh, the simple way to think about it is as follows. Let's say you're traveling from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv on a bus. It takes about an hour, right? It takes about an hour. And you, you realize, uh-oh, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so what do you do? <laughs> so what do you do? Sometimes you say to yourself, I need to go, but it's not so bad. I'll go when I get to Tel Aviv. I can wait an hour, right? Sometimes you say, uh, nope. <laughs> I don't want to get stuck in the middle. So I'll miss this bus. I'll go to the bathroom. And I'll go take the next bus. What can I do? I can't get on the bus now because within an hour, it's not going to be good, right? I'm going to have to go. So this is different way, uh, way of measuring how much is prohibited of pr uh, for praying. Let's see it inside. It says there are two levels of need. I'm on page 69 at the bottom. Number one, a need so pressing that it is impossible to wait even the amount of time it takes to walk up our side, which is approximately 72 minutes. So you know you're not going to be able to make it to Tel Aviv on the bus. That is need level one. And need level two is a need to relieve oneself, but which can be controlled for longer than 72 minutes. So if a person has began to recite the Amidah, when he cannot control his need to defecate for 72 minutes, his prayer is considered an abomination. He does not fulfill his obligation. You are not allowed to pray if you really need to, to go to the bathroom so much that you can't wait for 72 minutes. That's the, so I say, a bus to Tel Aviv, approximately. If you know that you can't hold it in for that long, you're not allowed to pray. You've got to go to the bathroom first. But if you can, let me just finish, and then, then I'll take the questions. Uh, instead, he must go back and repeat his prayer after he relieves himself. However, if he recites the Amidah when he cannot control his need to urinate for 72 minutes, although it is clear he did not act in accordance with the halal, this is making a difference between defecation and urination. Right? For, for if you need to, you know, what do we say sometimes? Number two versus number one, right? Yes. <laughs> if you need to make number two and you dive it, it's not kosher. But if you need to make number one and you didn't do the right thing, but you dive in, so there's a debate whether or not you, your, your prayer is considered a abomination. And halacha lamaisa, there's no obligation to repeat the prayer. But it is good to pray a voluntary prayer. We'll talk about that, uh, that there's such a concept of making a voluntary prayer if the halacha tells you to. However, if a person is able to control himself for 72 minutes and he recites the Amidah, his prayer is considered valid because his need to relieve himself is not so urgent. In any case, lechatchila, the best is, even a person who can wait 72 minutes is prohibited from praying. Even if he was praying in a minyan, he must relieve himself. If you gotta go, you gotta go first. And pray individually. If, however, before he relieves himself, the time to pray will pass. Now, this is not a question of making a minyan, it's a question of are you gonna be missing out on the time of mincha, for example? You see the sun is setting. You gotta go a little bit, but you can wait. So you can pray. Better to pray and not miss the time of mincha. And uh, uh, pray immediately so they will not miss praying altogether. The estimation of a person's ability to control himself can only be determined by you, by the person himself. 
Sometimes, uh, you know, you do your best to make a, I think I can wait and hold it in for an hour. But then, after half an hour, you say, hmm. You, you davened because you thought you could hold it in. And then you see, uh, I was wrong. The prayer is still considered to be valid because you didn't do anything wrong. You, you made a mistaken estimation. And if he has a doubt as to whether he needs to relieve himself or not, the best thing to do is to go to relieve yourself and not miss out on praying. But you should not miss out on praying with a minion for that person. If it's only doubtful, then you shouldn't miss the minion. So if you're not sure, then um, if you're not sure at all, if you need to, uh, then uh, you should you you should daven with the minyan. Um, there's a t- story in the Talmud about the rabbi who, on his way from his house to the synagogue, he would go to the bathroom five times to check himself to make sure he didn't need to to to, to relieve himself anymore. What a high level of piety. To, to, <laughs> but uh, you know, obviously you don't have to go crazy. But um, usually when you're busy doing something, of course it changes as you get older. You know, the bladder gets somehow pressed on and you need to relieve yourself more often. So it should be a standard that you uh, get ready for prayer. You relieve yourself first and then you go to pray. Wash your hands, of course, when you come out of the bathroom. And then you're all set. And then you put on your gartel and your hat and jacket, and then you're ready to go. Uh, but it's part of getting ready for prayers that you should relieve yourself. Okay? Now I'll take your question. So, I want to give an example. Uh, when you say the Kaddish, we need to have many other Yes, 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 yes. Just imagine the beginning of the Minyan, and I need to go to the toilet. Mm-hmm. Because I have medical problems. Yes. You know that before. Yeah. Like we know uh, when you have the problems with your prostate, mm-hmm. it can come in one second. Yeah. Go. You gotta go. So what's yeah. about that? Because you gotta go. I'm the number ten to have me young. Right. Right. So I cannot leave because then they cannot have the uh, the the uh, uh, the me young. So that's the next oh, yeah, section. Okay. Good question. That's the next section of our book. Let's keep reading. <laughs> it talks about it in the very next section. Okay. Um, so uh, also the question is even uh, you're not supposed to be studying Torah if you need to go to the bathroom. The class here is a two-hour class almost. What if you need to go in the middle? So he says on page 71, one who can wait at 72 minutes, according to most achronim, is permitted lechatchila to recite brachot and to learn Torah. So um, if you don't want to leave in the middle of class, it could be disruptive, it could be disrespectful. If you can hold it in, hold it in. Obviously, if you can't, you got to go, you got to go. Now, the second, section 10 is what happens if you're in the middle of praying and you need to go. Like you're saying, you're in the middle of a minyan, you're with 10 people there waiting for you. What do you, what do, you do? So he says as follows. Page 71 at the bottom, okay? Section 10. One who can wait, uh, uh, the three, lo- uh, I'll read from the number 10. One who needs to relieve himself in the middle of praying. The ruling regarding a person who does not need to relieve himself when he starts to pray. So you did nothing wrong. But in the middle, of his prayer feels a rising need, is based on how much he needs to relieve himself and what stage of the prayer he's in. There are three levels of need concerning this law. Number one level is one who can wait 72 minutes to per- is permitted to finish praying. One who estimates that it will not be able to wait 72 minutes but does not yet have to contain the urge and would have to exert himself slightly to relieve himself at the moment. Since when he started to pray, he was permitted, his immediate need is not so great, he may finish the section that he's praying. So, for example, right, we talked about it before, that there's different sections of the prayers. If the need arises in the middle of Psuke de Zimra, you should wait until reciting Ishtabach, thereby finishing Psuke de Zimra, and then go relieve himself. If the need arises when he's reciting Birkot Kriyat Shema, he may, in principle, finish the Brachot. However, because he will need to relieve himself before Shemona Yisrael, 
better not to pause between Gal Yisrael and the Amidah, therefore should relieve himself immediately upon finishing the specific bracha or paragraph that he's reciting. So if you need to go in the middle of a section, you've got to go. And then, of course, the one who has actively suppressed the need to relieve himself while praying is in the most serious stage because at this point he's transgressing the prohibition. Do not abominate oneself. Lo teshaktsu. You should not make yourself something, do something disgusting. If you've got to go to the bathroom and you're holding it in, right? You see little kids that they don't want to, they don't want to miss out on something. And you see they're, they're holding it in. You're not allowed to pray in that situation. If he's saying, he must immediately go relieve himself. Since interruption at that point is not so serious. However, if he's in the middle of the Amidah, or a pause at that point is serious, and if when he began to reciting the Amidah, he did not feel the need to relieve himself, he should finish praying. You don't interrupt the Amidah very lightly. You always, uh, you're never supposed to interrupt the Amidah, only in a situation which he's incapable of waiting at all. You don't want to have an accident. You don't want to make a mess in the middle of your uh, shul or, or living room. So then you go to relieve himself. But um, So it doesn't directly answer your question about minyan, but you can learn from this law about your own prayers. Everything except for the amidah, pretty much you have to go and uh, relieve yourself and uh, then continue praying. If you're in the middle of the amidah, you... Um, Unless you're going to have an accident, then you you uh, you hold it in as best you can. Uh, uh, you hold it in until you finish the Amidah because you really don't want to interrupt. But everything else, you really should not be praying at all. So when you're asking me about a minyan, you it's, it could be embarrassing, but you have to tell the people, hang on one minute, I gotta go somewhere important, come back. I'll have to wait. Because if you're not allowed to pray when your uh, bladder is full or, uh, uh, you know, number two as well, you're not allowed to pray, you're not allowed to answer a main, you're not allowed to join in the Kaddish and that, so they, I'm sorry, they want to wait and make a Kaddish and they want to pray in a Minyan, but if you're not able to, you're not able to. But uh, I think people are usually understanding if someone has to step out for a moment. They understand, you step out, you come back. Um, it's best, it can be, uh, you know, uh, it could be uh, difficult to stand the pressure of the, the group, but the bottom line is you're not ready to pray until you've relieved yourself. So you get to the synagogue, relieve yourself, and then enter. Enter when you're ready to pray. But, but, but yeah. also to relieve yourself before waking, after waking up and before going to bed, right? That's not a halacha. I think that's just common sense. <laughs> Usually your bladder is full when you wake up after the morning and, and uh, you want to sleep a long time, so you relieve yourself, empty it out. But that's not a halacha. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with, with sleeping with a bladder full. There's nothing wrong with waking up with a bladder full. The problem is saying the brachot and learning Torah and specifically praying the Amidah, that is prohibited when, you're, when your uh, bladder is full. So that's um, a different law. That's just convenience. But to read for self before shacharit. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, when you get up, you're also reading yourself a shacharit. It's part of the same. You're accomplishing two things at once. <laughs> yeah, let's say that you, uh, you wake up from a very short sleep and you didn't drink a lot. You don't have to go to the bathroom. I mean, no, it's, uh, it's about it, an emergency. Emergency, yeah. In an emergency, you gotta go. Yeah, if it's an emergency, uh, you don't have to wet yourself uh, in public. There's no that that overrides uh, the the uh, public embarrassment is very uh, uh, the, the halacha is very sensitive to it, and uh, it's called kavod habriot, honor dignity of the creations. Of, so every every creature has uh, dignity. And it uh, overrides uh, even a, um, a negative commandment. So the Talmud explains the negative command that it overrides is the rabbinic, uh, the, the commandment to, to listen to the, to, to the rabbis. So any rabbinic law is overrided, overridden, when you have a problem of dignity 
of uh, human dignity. Uh, if it's a biblical command, then it's, it's not so simple. But um, all these laws of prayer, there's all, they're all rabbinic laws, and therefore, if you've got to go, if you're worried that you'll have a, you know, a, like you said, it's an emergency, it overrides. Uh, but what we've been looking at it from another angle is even if it's not an emergency, the very fact that you have a need to, to relieve yourself, it disables you from praying. It's inappropriate to pray in such a state. It's called uh, an abomin abomination. It's called a dirty state, right? You're not allowed to pray when you have uh, you know, excrement inside you. You're, you're being disrespectful to the prayer. So it's a separate issue other than, of course, the, the public dignity. For sure, that's, that applies in every... And you're not allowed to pray if your bladder's full. How full? So that's what we discussed. Level one, level two, level three, and so forth. You, you, you can say, if there is an emergency, whatever it is, you need to, to, to stop and to go. Yes. Like when I remembered uh, Rosh Hashanah, we are ready to, to read in Torah, and someone will come to me and say, there's a fire in your apartment. Of course. I need to go. Of so course. Then, of course, of course, of course, of course. If there's danger to life, fire is dangerous. Uh, we haven't been talking about danger to life. This is an emergency of a different kind. But, <laughs> of course, any, any uh, danger to life overrides all the mitzvot of the different kind of, uh, different kinds of emergency. Okay, let's, uh, we've pretty much finished chapter five. And uh, you, again, you can read and fill in the uh, other sections that we've uh, uh, we've skipped over, we may come back to the laws of drunkenness. When? Purim. Purim. Before Purim, we'll have to, we'll have to sharpen up our our uh, laws of prayer when it comes to drunkenness. But hopefully, it's not too common during the year. Okay, chapter 6, the wording of the prayer. Differences in the Nusach. Sephardi Ashkenazi, we're going to talk about before. And he talks about immigrants, people who come from different communities to, to, you know, praying in a shul which has a different custom. How do you do that? So this is chapter 6. We're going to try to cover uh, most of this together now, okay? But we didn't sing our song yet today. Let's take a break and sing our songs. Two songs. Anybody need one? Yes. Take. Pinchas, you have a song? Yeah, we'll start with this one. Start with the uh, 12 tribes. You should know it off by heart. You don't know that. You don't need the sheets. You have it, Pinchas? Okay, the 12 tribes. Here, here, give them this. Give them this. Just, sorry, has it? Okay. You know, take this one because it has the extra words. It has the extra, I wrote in the extra words. Explain to him what I said. That the, okay. Ruven, Shimon, Levi. Yehuda, you remember it off the heart? Yisachar, Zvulon, Benay, Lea, slower. Kat, Asher, Benay, Zilpa, Dan, Naftali, Benay, Bilha, Ule, Rachel, Shnei, Bani, Yosef Uveniami Uvesach Hakol Roim Shenayush Shneim Asar The Twelve Sons of Yaakov. 
She knows. She she's. A, I'm not sure. You test her. You you ask her. You tell her. You know it. <laughs> you learn it. Learn to sing the song together. Okay. One more song. What the, what's the parasha this week? Now yeah, this this also take the one of these. It has the the extra words at the bottom. Is the extra words in the bottom? <laughs> sure. Uh, what's the parsha this week? Vayera, <laughs> yafe. And um, let me ask you a question: In which parsha did the Jewish people leave Egypt? Bo. Good. Where is Bo? Not the book of Shemot, but the parsha is when they actually leave is number two, Bo. Shemot is the second Chumash, right? Mm-hmm. And the Parsha is the third Parsha. Shemot, Va'era, and Bo. And they leave in Bo. When do they go through the sea? In uh, Yipro. Nope. Nash. Beshalach. Beshalach. When they send that, we sing the song. It's known as Shabbat Shira. We sing the song of the sea. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Where, in what parsha, do we find the story of the rebellion against Moshe? Korach. Where is Korach? In the book of... Book of? Bamidbar. Bamidbar. What book is that? Number? Number four. Number four. Which parsha? Look in, look in number four. Bamidbar. Korach. That's right, the fifth parsha. Parsha Korach. Parshat Korach. Korach was the rebel, rebel against Moshe, right? Which parsha do we have? Moshe begging to go into the land of Israel. In which parsha does Moshe beg, plea, to, to supplicate to go into the land of Israel? Nope. Uh, Actually, it's too far. Too far. Th- yeah, too far. By oh. right at the end. Yeah. yeah. It's like not. A, it's, it is at the <laughs> end. You're in the right direction. It is at the end. <laughs> book. Nope. Book number five. You're all right. Look at Devarim. Right. <laughs> Devarim. The second parsha. <laughs> no. Va et Hanan. The word means, and I begged, <laughs> and I pleaded. That's what the word va'et chanan means. Right? Like tachanun is supplications. Va'et chanan, I supplicated. Moshe is telling the story that he asked to go into the land of Israel. So, okay, that's va'et chanan. Parshat va'et chanan. Okay, now I'll ask you, in what parsha does Yaakov die? In va'yehiku. Close, you say it properly. Vayehi, vayehi. Close. It's. It's a vayehi. It's a chet. It's a chet. They didn't put in the ch, but it's vayehi. It's a chet. The last parsha in Bereshit. You see that Bereshit is number one, section 12, parsha 12. That's where Yaakov dies. Vayehi. 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 It starts off that Vayehi Yaakov. Yaakov lived. And it tells the story of his dying. Isn't that ironic? Right? The parsha begins that Yaakov lived. It tells the story that he died. Also, to teach us something. Also, look at parasha number five. In Bereshit. What happens in the parasha, the life of Sarah? She, she dies. And it's life, <laughs> the life of Sarah. It says that her life was so many years, 127 years, and then she died. So too with Yaakov. It says Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt for so many years, and then he died. Chayei <laughs> Sarah, the life of Sarah, yeah, it's, it's a, two, two words instead of one. Like lech lecha, two words instead of one. Some parashiyot get two. 
An Chaye Sarah? Wow. You and 30 other, 30,000 others. Wow. Where are you staying? Yeah. Uh, the other guy, she's uh, fixing a place where we can stay. Lovely. There are some connections. Okay. So, uh, okay. The Shabbat, we will be there. Okay, you should see Rev Lisman. He yeah. always goes. Really? Yeah. His, uh, his father-in-law lives in Hebron. Ah, we yeah. went to his house. Ah. On the Shabbat that we were there. Yes. We went to his father-in-law's house. An 80-year-old man. Oh, Hashem. Tov, anyways, um, are you ready to, to, to recite the parashat? Yes. Hmm. <speaking in Hebrew> Vayigash Vayichi Shmot Vaera Bo Beshalach Yitro Mishpatim Teruma Tetave Ki Tisa Vayakhel Pekude Vayikra Tzav Shmini Tazriya Mehel Tzora Acharei Mot Kedoshim Emor Be'am Ve'chukotai Ha'midbar Nasor Be'alotecha Shlach lecha Korach ukat Balak binchas Matot maske Devarim Ba'et chanan Ekev re'ei Lovely, good. Good. Good, good. You'll get the hang of it, slowly but surely. Beautiful. Okay. It's a very uh, easy way to, to remember it, because music makes it... Uh, That's it. Special. That's right. That's right. We have to sing more. Sach hakol. Sach means sum. Hakol means total. Sum total. Uh, I said in Chinese, some total. You have a list. One plus two plus five plus six plus fifteen equals some total. Chungsu, chungsu, sahakol, sahakol, some total, total. Chungsu. Okay. All right. Chapter six. Okay, chapter 6, open up the book. The Laws of Prayer, Pnimei Alacha, chapter 6. Nusach. What does Nusach mean? It means the wording. The truth is, there's another meaning in some, in some uh, contexts. The Nusach means the tune, the style of chanting. But in this context, it means the words. It doesn't mean the tune, it means the words. Okay? The differences in Nusach. Following the exile from the land of Israel and the scattering of the Jewish communities, distinctions 
were created among the diverse ethnic groups. In Hebrew, how do you say different ethnic groups? Eidot. Eidot HaMizrach is the ethnic groups from the east. And you could say Eidot Ashkenaz, which means Germany. Right? So the ethnic group from Germany, we have different groups. And some distinctions, changes. Hmm? Uh, the Ashkama uh, is song of the Kumi of Yapo. The, the, the Torah. The, um, yeah, 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 yeah. One of the sons of, 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 of Yavan, that's right. Yes. The, the Ashkama is the song of the Kumi. Gomer, yes, 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 yes. yes. Yafo. Yeah, Yafo, I think you mean Yavan. What do you mean Yafo? Uh, what Yafo? Yafo. Okay, Yafo. Okay, so what? Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, well uh, the part of uh, Jews uh, named Ashkenazi. I, because Ashkenaz became the word for what today we call Germany. For many hundreds of years, oh. everybody called the country Germany Ashkenaz. Uh, it's the name of a country. Uh, uh, Just like Yavan. It's uh, one of the children of Noah. But we know that Yavan is, is Greece. Yavan is Greece. It's the name of a country. So Ashkenaz is the name of a country. Uh, so Ashkenazi Jews are group Jews who lived in Germany. Okay? That's why. All right. Uh, so there were changes. In the main prayers, those instituted by Anshay Knesset Hagdola, who are Anshay Knesset Hagdola? The, the men of the Great Assembly, 120, very good. What are the main prayers that were instituted, such as Birkot Kriyat Shema and the Amidah? Differences are very slight. Even in the main passages of the Korbanot and Psuke de Zimra, which were established during the time of the Talmud and the Gaonim, a little bit later, the disparities are minor, the very, very minor differences. The modifications are more noticeable, however, in the supplements added during the period of the Rishonim, such as additions to the Korbanot passages and prayers concluding the service. What was customary to include in Spain was not necessarily accepted in Ashkenaz, and vice versa. This is especially apparent in the liturgy for the high holidays and festivals, composed during the time of the Geonim and Rishonim. Hence we find completely different P.U. team poems in the high holiday prayers of the Sephardic and Ashkenazic services. I want to qualify that. It's not completely different, but there are some that are completely different. Some are the same. We have the same PU team as well in, in, in many instances. In the Slichot, there are very many similarities, of course, but there are differences. What do we do? It is proper, says Rabbi Malama, that every Jew continue in his family's custom. Even if he knows that a certain Nusach is more precise, Continuation of tradition is more important than the accuracy of one word or another. Right? This is a very important principle that we try to retain our family traditions. The Ariya Kadosh clarifies the differences in wording and style between Sephardim and Ashkenazim. He explains that there are 12 windows in heaven corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. And the prayer of each tribe ascends through its particular gate. That is the enigma of the 12 gates mentioned at the conclusion of the book of Ezekiel. 12 gates in heaven for each tribe of the Jewish people. So each tribe, their prayers go through their gate. And the, uh, it's, it's a metaphor, really, because we're all from the tribe of Judah. But Ashkenazim and Sephardim. But the theory, the, the, the point of the Arizal was saying that 
every community and their customs of prayer are acceptable in heaven mm -hmm. and they should continue to use that gate in heaven for their community. And in another community, they have their gate to heaven. The, the, what is the difference uh, between the Svata and the Svati? So, um, I wonder if he says it here, but I'll explain. Uh, I'll explain. Sfaradi mm -hmm. usually is Edot HaMizrach, the communities from the East. But it includes uh, Spanish communities, it includes uh, Iranian communities, Iran, Iraq, China, yes. India. Yes. They're in the East. That's Sfaradi. That's Sfaradi. That's, that's uh, yeah. And also North Africa. That's Sfaradi. They're all Sfaradi. Eidota Mizrach or Sfaradi, same thing. I'll put that on the board. Right? Um, to make it clear. So I'll write it in English letters. Eidot Ha Mizrach. Mizrach means East. So, Edot means communities, communities of the East, that equals Sephardi, Sephardi, okay, or Sephardi, Sephardi, okay? Usually, we say this is different than Ashkenazi, or a dot Ashkenaz. A dot Ashkenaz. Communities of Germany. Most of Europe was like Germany. So we have Europe versus Eastern countries. Mizrach. Okay? Now, the there was a great rabbi, you might have heard of him, the Arizal, the holy, his name was Yitzchak, Elohi Rabbi Yitzchak, that's why they gave him the, the nickname, Ari, Elohi Rabbi Yitzchak. He was a great, great, great Kabbalist. Lived in Tzfat in the 16th century. 500 years ago. And he was a Kabbalist. And he was a I had an Ashkenazi father and a Sephardi mother. Oh, <laughs> and he was, he was a, a great Kabbalist and he taught how to pray. And he said, many things that I see in the Sephardi communities, I should be add them to the Ashkenazi prayers. So he sort of did a mix. And so, in the middle, we have something called Nusach, the wording of Nusach Sephard, not Sephardi, Sephard. That is somehow a little bit of a mix. It's mostly Ashkenaz with some additional stuff from the Eastern communities added in. And it became very, very popular because not only the uh, Ari, but also the Hasidim. Later on, the Hasidic communities, which uh, a lot was, became very popular in, in Europe, they took on this custom, these, these, uh, these customs. Uh -huh. And so um, here in this yeshiva, we dive in Nusach. Again, all this is... Nusach, which means the wording, the wording of this style, this style, or this style. There's also, uh, there's also Yemenite, <laughs> and there's also others. But the three major ones are Ashkenazi and Sfaradi, and Nusach Sfard. It's more Ashkenazi, 
So this is a stronger line. It's more that, you know, nowadays you'd say, well, the Ashkenazim, there's two types. There's Ashkenazim. These are people from Europe. And then they could either be davening Nusach Ashkenaz or Nusach Sfard. If you're Sfardi, you daven Nusach Sfardi. There's, of course, you know, a few divisions, a few differences between if you come from Iran, Iraq, Morocco, there's different... Within the Sephardi world, there are some different sub-communities. But the major division, in most, uh, for the most part, the biggest differences are between Sephardi and Ashkenazi, whereas you have Ashkenaz and Sephard as two sub, sub-categories of, of the Ashkenazi rite. It's very similar. The Ashkenaz and Sephard are very similar. Sephard is more similar to Ashkenaz than it is to Sephardi. It's a few words changed here and there. The order of some of the prayers gets changed. But uh, the style is more Ashkenazi versus the Sephardi. Eastern ethnic communities have a, have a different style of also some words and some orders of the prayers, but also the style of of singing, the tunes. So you have Sfard and Ashkenaz very similar, and Sfaradi uh, being uh, more Eastern, Eastern style. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah? You knew that. You knew that. You knew most of it. Yeah. You got it? Clear. Okay. Well, if you're from China, that's in the East. Sfaradi. <laughs> Maybe you should be Sephardi. <laughs> ah, you, yeah, it depends where you, where you study, where, where you learn. Who taught you? Did Ashkenazim teach you? Uh, no, uh, uh, That's right, because of your, your stomach trouble. <laughs> your stomach trouble, Crohn's disease. Crohn's is an Ashkenazi disease, right? Okay. We don't know. Uh, also, many people come to Judaism and who are their first teachers around the world? Which particular Ashkenazis? Chabad! Chabad are Hasidim. So they have their own version of Sfard, which is, uh, you could say it's even... Um, with, within Sfard, within the Ari, you have... A few versions. <laughs> Chabad is one special version of the Ari's uh, Sfard Nusach. But it's most simil- similar to Sfard. Which? Kabbalim. The Kabbalist. The Well, Ari was, uh, was the biggest Kabbalist. Oh. And so that you could say they have. Uh, it's called Nusach. Ari. Chabad has their own version of Nusach Ari. The Kabbalists use Nusach Ari, maybe a different version of Nusach Ari. This, you know. But uh, yeah, the, the Mekubalim. There are Mekubalim Sfaradim. Most, very big Mekubalim Sfaradim. Like, uh, many of them, not all, not most, I don't know if most, but uh, many, many Mekubalim are Sfaradim. Which is fine, because what did the Ari do? He sort of brought in some of the Sfaradi wordings into the Ashkenazi world. So uh, the Sephardim, they uh, continue the Daven Sephardi and they, they agree, Ari agree they, they're doing what the Ari said also because the Ari wanted them to add in those, those specific words according to the Kabbalah. Is that clear? Yes. Other, other, have you been to a Yemenite synagogue? Yeah. Ani, Ani, <laughs> I was. yeah? Yes. Uh, you like it? Yes. Different, uh, different tunes, uh, different yeah. tunes to the ear. Mm, uh, yes, different also. Uh, we're all Jewish. Okay. We're all <laughs> praying to one God. <laughs> one God. <laughs> all the different nusachim. Okay, all the different wordings. We'll stop here for today. Continue chapter 6.